Hello and welcome to FML Fund My Life, a podcast brought to you by My Wall Street. This episode is all about the frequently asked questions we get asked in My Wall Street on a daily basis from new investors and wannabe ones too. So we had the brilliant idea of going straight to the source and speaking with someone who gets asked these questions every day. So we invited Poppy onto the show. She is my Wall Street's customer experience specialist. Hi, Poppy. How are you? Hi, how are you doing? <laughs> Great. It's nice to Thank- be here. Oh, Thanks so much for coming on. And of course, we also have Anne-Marie, as usual, who is my co-host. Hi, Anne-Marie. Thanks. <laughs> Hi. How are you guys? <laughs> Great. So, Poppy, how did you kind of get into being my Wall Street's customer experience specialist? I know you used to be a writer actually around the same time I joined my Wall Street we both were writing for the company yeah um I mean it goes back a little bit further than that like um so I think so I'm originally an anthropologist um I have the degree and everything so <laughs> um when the pandemic started I was doing my anthropology master's degree and I it, I needed some money so (laughs) I picked up some freelancing writing work and uh, one of them was my Wall Street Um, and then I graduated so I started in about a March of 2020 and I graduated in September and then a few weeks later I got a call from James (laughs) who does Mm -hmm. the uh, Stock Club podcast Um, and they said they were kind of looking for a part-time customer support rep and that my style of writing shows that I know the tone and knowledge of my Wall Street yep. so I just kind of did it part-time for a year um, whilst the pandemic was still in full flow and then I was hired full-time as a customer experience specialist last October so it's nice I don't just do customer support work anymore mm-hmm. I feel like I'm yep. part of the fabric of my Wall Street now <laughs> yeah definitely yeah. amazing <laughs> that's your journey so far and yeah when you're not busy doing everything customer experience specialist wise um you've been learning how to drive recently that's that's right isn't it (laughs) yeah I've been learning how to drive at the good old age of 28 to be 29 this week so (laughs) that's Um, you know what I'm I'm 27 and I'm I have actually no intention of learning how to drive soon so you're doing better than me well that was me last year to be fair so yeah well I just feel like when you live in a city I don't know I'm also like really scared to learn how to drive but I'm, I need to learn like soon I feel like it's just the right of passage isn't it yeah yeah, yeah. do you yeah. drive on Marie yeah I have a like well I got my license when I was like 16 or 17 because uh when you grow up in America it's like necessary that you have a car to be able to get anywhere particular <laughs> grew up in Colorado and we have where my like where I lived we had no public transport so if you didn't drive a car there was nowhere to go um so yeah it's like drive to high school and stuff like that so I can drive however I cannot drive a manual which I know see so you're basically the same as me because I know <laughs> I don't know that's fair because it's so easy to learn how to drive in America like that's why you all learn at 16 it's like yeah well <laughs> yes but at least like I learned and like have a license and yeah, can drive yeah. and can drive here I actually just drove in Italy actually I went on vacation and I drove in Italy and oh. Italian people really are prepared to leave the earth at a moment's notice the way that they drive they're Mm. so aggressive they drive so close behind you because they want you to pull over and let them go and it was an incredibly stressful experience and i I would not recommend it yeah imagine uh, doing that in a in a manual car (laughs) no i wouldn't be doing that now yeah no like driving to me just looks so scary i'm just like i'll walk or get the metro now (laughs) i'll walk (laughs) i'll walk i walk everywhere in lisbon but it's all hills so it's horrible as well fair enough all right yeah okay so this episode is great if you're thinking about investing because we're going to get really into the nitty-gritty and talk about the different steps on how to get invested while answering these questions so if you're about to start your investing journey stick around because we're going to answer all of the most common questions that we get so let's hop into them the first question poppy is how do you offer a free trial in my wall street Well, this is an easy one to start with, and it actually also feels a bit like a sneaky marketing tactic to include it in here, but (laughs) you would actually be surprised how often we get asked this question. Um, So the answer is we offer a seven day free trial, um, and this is for anyone signing up for an annual subscription. And I think this is really great because it allows anyone to sign up and see if they can benefit from our content and from our expertise, um, particularly beginners. Um, and if it isn't for them, we don't force anyone to stay with us. So they can just change their mind at any point before the seven mm-hmm. days are over. 
Um, okay, I have, I have the second question here, and this is one that we get very commonly from virtually everyone outside of the United States who's interested in investing, because I think people really associate investing with Americans, uh, for better or for worse. So if you are outside of the United States, can you invest in U.S. stocks? So, yeah, this one's a tad trickier to answer. Um, theoretically, the answer is yes. Yes, you can invest in any stock market you want, including the U.S., um, no matter which country you're in. However, the issue, the issue is then finding a broker that can facilitate your trades. So, for example, in Nigeria, most of the major international brokers, such as interactive brokers or E-Trade, do not function in Nigeria because the regulations are different. So then you need to find a broker that can work within your specific country's regulations and then also has access to the stock market that you want to invest in. Um, so <laughs> that's the first layer. And then it gets a bit more complicated. So when you add nationality and resident status into the mix, um, it can lead to a few more complications. So for me, if I wanted to buy shares in Apple, I would then need to find a broker that allows me as a UK national living in Ireland to buy shares in the US stock market. Now, this scenario is relatively easy because you've got DeGiro, Interactive Brokers, Revolut, etc. I come from a country that they work in and I live in a country that they work in so there's no issue there um, but I did have a customer come in one day asking for a brokerage recommendation in a more complex situation he was a UK national living in Thailand and he wanted to invest in the US stock market um, and I'm, I'm not sure who he went with but I think I recommended interactive brokers as a potential um, because it Interactive Brokers works in Thailand and they allow UK nationals and they allow access to the US stock market. But these are all the things you have to think about when you're looking for a broker and wanting to invest in a specific stock market. So, yeah, you can theoretically invest in the US stock market from anywhere in the world, but you do need to be aware of the rules and regulations in your country that could impact your broker and potentially limit your investing ability. Yeah, I've actually been impacted by that as well. Um, yeah. I wanted to do some investment through Revolut, which is, is uh, Revolut's British, but they're uh, they're based in an Irish office now, or mm -hmm. they have banking, yeah. they like have a regulated banking status within Ireland. And I, as an American citizen, am not allowed to invest through Revolut because it's the responsibility mm -hmm. of Revolut to be reporting my investment back to the US government for tax purposes. And they're not equipped to do that at the minute. So I just, I like put in all my information. And then the last question was like, are you a US citizen? I hit yes. And it just like deleted my whole application and was like, we can't help you. Oh very, no. <laughs> I know. It's very disappointing to go all the way to the end and be like, well, never Because you can, you can invest if you are living in the US through Revolut, I think. Yeah. Yeah, they're mm -hmm. just not set up to do uh, foreign residencies at the minute. Yeah. So I that's mean, another complication. Like, Yeah. And Anne-Marie, why did you want to use Revolut as your trading brokerage? Um, it, you, it was just... Drive wealth? Yeah, I have a drive wealth. It was just the convenience of... Um, it was easier to move money, like, within yeah. the, the Revolut infrastructure because, like, I have money sitting in a Revolut account quite frequently from, like, paying yeah. my... You know, like, going out to dinner with my friends and, like, paying my friends or having them pay me. Um, and I was just like, oh, this is... Um, this is just a much faster, easier way for me to do things. Um, because when I use drive wealth, like I'm waiting, you know, the couple of days yeah. to like move my monthly yeah. deposit in. Um, yeah. And so I was just like, well, maybe I'll use Revolut. So when I have, you know, split second investment decisions, maybe I can do it right then and there. <laughs> but in some ways, I suppose it's good that I'm limited to drive wealth because that is more in line with, you know, my overall investment thesis of, you know, thinking about an investment decision for a long period of time and really mulling it over and then, you know, going in and, and making the purchase. I think I was a bit frantic in, in, the, mo in the moment. This was early days. Um, hmm. I think we've, we've, we've grown from there, unfortunately. Yeah, no, I use Revolut as well for the same reason. I think I just find it's like easier to um because mm. you always have money in that account, and also like I have the like the premium Revolut one. Oh so yeah, like yeah, I have, they're uh, all free, so that's great. Yeah. Um, but yeah, Poppy, you've worked on a guide to list different brokerages. Is that right? Yes, I have. Um, you can find this guide actually on the My Wall Street Help Center. It's just mm -hmm. help .mywallstreet .com. Um, Perfect. and you just search for, I do not have a broker <laughs> and it'll mm. pop up for you. And it gives you a list of brokerages based on, uh, your region in the world. That's nice. amazing. We'll actually link that below this episode so yeah. everyone can see it and find it nice and easily. So go. then going on to the next question. So if someone came to you and said they are a brand new user, can you help them get started or, and they've just kind of downloaded the app and they want to know how to use it? What would you say? 
So, yeah, we can. Um, our app is perfect for new starters. It's simply laid out. This, you've got the tabs at the bottom and all our content is presented in a timeline news feed. Um, in our stocks tab, you can find all our short list of recommended stocks as well as the stock of the month. And these are our regular content that people enjoy paying our subscription for. Um, and then in the learn tab at the bottom right hand corner, this is a free aspect of the, of the free uh, subscription that you can get. Um, this can build your basic knowledge and give you all the tools that you need to get started investing. Plus, if you get lost at any point, you can use our search function and you can contact us. Or I should really say me because it's me on the other <laughs> end of that contact link. Um, and then you could also go to the help center, which pretty much has the answer to the majority of our questions we get asked on a daily basis. So all these questions you're asking me here today are pretty much answered on the help center as well. Um, yeah. But I would also recommend using the blog. It has a fantastic selection of resources for getting started. It even has a limited podcast series. Yeah. It's really good. Oh, yeah, the Get, the get Started podcast. Yeah. 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 It's like a main thing I send to people. I'm like, just listen to this. Yeah. Easy. Yeah. Walk around and listen. Yeah. <laughs> and our podcast. Of course. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah, definitely. Yeah, <laughs> Poppy, why is that not the first port of call? <laughs> FML first yeah. and then getting started. Mm -hmm. We can direct them to getting started. Come on. <laughs> Well, we will now. Now we've got this episode. <laughs> yeah, there we go. Okay, I have maybe a more complex question. I know I have heard this question a lot. We get it written in a lot. I think we've had to cover it on the Stock Club podcast. And that is, what is the difference between Berkshire Hathaway's A class shares and their B class shares? And just for people who know, Berkshire Hathaway is, uh, you know, the very famous fund that's run by Warren Buffett. Um, but they have two different classes of shares, both of which are publicly listed, and you can buy either. So what are the differences for people that are maybe interested in making a, you know, a very wise investment in Berkshire Hathaway? So I actually really like this question. It's quite interesting. Um, I wouldn't say this is a very common question. It's actually quite rare. Um, but these type of questions get me to build my own knowledge. So I really like them. Um, mm. But to answer this question, we kind of need to know the general difference between class A shares and class B shares in like most companies who have this, uh, this system. Um, so taken straight from Investopedia, it states that when more than one class of stock is offered, companies traditionally designate them as class A and class B, um, with class A carrying more voting rights than class B shares. Class A shares may offer 10 voting rights per stock held, whilst class B shares offer only one. Um, also, an interesting fact is that if a company was to go bankrupt, then class A shares would take priority in any payouts that if the company was forced into liquidation. So essentially, class A shares are like they have more value. Mm -hmm. um, so with Berkshire Hathaway, both types of shares are available to buy as a retail investor. So that's me and you. Um, however, the difference is in price and voting rights. So <laughs> for Berkshire Hathaway class A shares, they are the most expensive shares on the market. Um, one share comes in at over $423,000. Um, and back in 2021, before the current market state, this was closer to about 500000 um, and Warren Buffett has stated he's never going to split these Class A shares um, because his reasoning is that he wants to only attract long-term, high-quality buy-and-hold investors like himself. Um, also, people who have a lot of money. <laughs> and this kind of dis discourages scalpers and day traders. That's essentially his whole mantra. Um, but then he released Class B shares in 1996, and they're a bit more affordable for the everyday invest investors such as me and you. But they currently hold like one ten thousandth of the voting rights that Class A shares have. So they're much less valuable, um, but they're cheaper. So you can buy Class B shares for around $280 per share, which is pretty reasonable. Um, again, in this market, they could get even cheaper. But yeah, mm. <laughs> I think it's a good investment, to be honest. Berkshire Hathaway is a really good investment for long term and holders. Does anyone know which stock, which uh, class of shares has grown more? I, they grow in uh, like relation to one oh, another. Oh, right. So okay, they right. are tied together. So like, you know, if like, for example, Berkshire oh. Hathaway over five years was to go up 100%, they would both go up 100%. It just has to do with um, like vote, like to when the board holds votes, like it just would have to, you know, impact your rate. That being said, you'd have to hold a phenomenal amount of Berkshire Hathaway for your vote to be 
worth anything, mm. whether it be if you're holding class A or class um, um, B shares. Um, yeah, you see, you tend to see voting rights and shares be discussed more by advocate investors, like people who want to go into companies and like help change them. So they end mm. up buying up like five or 10% of the company, and then they go to the board and start pressuring the board to make actions. Um, we've seen that happen a couple of times that actually happened with GameStop. And that is what happened, what triggered the uh, GameStop short squeeze about two years ago. Oh, very interesting. Okay, so I learned something new today. Always great. Nice. Me too. <laughs> and Anne Marie, you actually just did um, a stock update on a company that you called the Baby Berkshire. Yeah. So I was updating a, a company called Markle um, or Merkel. Is it E R or A R? Yeah, I didn't want to say it there. I said the company that you called. So I was like, how do I pronounce that again? <laughs> uh, its ticker is MKL. Anyway, uh, they call it the Baby Berkshire because it was conceived very much uh, in the same vein as as Warren Buffett. So it is also an insurance company. For those of you who don't know, Berkshire Hathaway is actually an insurance company. Um, but insurance companies bring in a tremendous amount of cash from people uh, paying their insurance every month. And then obviously the company doesn't need to use that money unless they need to pay out on someone's policy. And more often than that, that doesn't happen. So it means insurance companies have a lot of money. Uh, Merkel's the same uh they have a tremendous amount of money so they they buy up shares in other companies and and they are quite a nice little investment firm now um and so i was updating their comments just checking in with them they are a very consistent player they're very focused on value they own a lot of recognizable american companies similar to berkshire hathaway you know stuff like apple home depot um texas instruments which makes those calculators if you're familiar with them um and so it was actually a kind of nice update for the current market conditions. I think people mm -hmm. are a little bit nervous. And so you should be looking for those big, stable stocks that mm -hmm. are in themselves quite diversified. You know, that's going to give you stability in markets like this. Um, yeah. So if you're interested in Berkshire Hathaway, Merkel is also worth a look. It's a smaller company, um, doesn't have as many assets under management, and actually is a little bit of a faster grower for that reason, um, because they're still in kind of their development phase. I would say Berkshire Hathaway is, is very much an established player at this point and, and isn't as quick moving, unfortunately. Mm. Amazing. Yeah. And if anyone wants to kind of read the full report and the rest of the stock updates, you can now just download my Wall Street and read them all because Anne-Marie and the rest of the investment team are always very busy um, updating all the stocks in our shortlist basically to make sure that nothing has changed. Yeah. And okay, so going on to the next question, this is actually, we get asked a lot on social as well. And I know how tricky it can be because we have to be careful about what we say. Um, but yeah, when you get asked, what's your opinion on a certain company? What do you say, Poppy? Yeah, so we also get asked this a lot. Um, and it's sometimes we have an answer for it. Um, but there's so many stocks on the stock market that quite often we're not looking at that stock in particular. Um, mm -hmm. However, if there is a company that my Wall Street's currently looking at and we get asked an opinion on it, I usually direct them to the article itself within our app or on the blog if we've got one on the blog. Um, or I direct them to the search function um, mm -hmm. in the app. And like in particular the blog I think is a fantastic resource because it doesn't just focus on the stocks in our app so it gives people it gives m at least me more ability to give people some content that they need that's not necessarily restricted to our shortlist um but yeah uh otherwise I actually just send them over to Mike <laughs> who you all have also heard on the Stock Club podcast um mm -hmm. because he usually has great insight into different companies that I personally wouldn't be aware of I have lots of other knowledge but <laughs> stocks, <laughs> stocks uh, in general maybe not so much <laughs> sometimes mm -hmm. they're quite good like we've gotten I know a user recommended that we look at Garmin um and we wrote a first yeah. look on them a couple weeks back, maybe a couple months back now at this point. And I was really impressed by Garmin. That got kicked over to me and I ended up taking a look at them. And they were a very good company. And the user who had kind of written into us had, you yeah. know, given us a couple bullet points being like, hey, like this looks like a My Wall Street shortlist um, type stock. And it was actually really nice to kind of have someone, you know, who's, who's taken some insights from us and kind of learned our investment thesis and be yeah. able to form their own thesis on something and then hand it over to us. So um, that was great. Sometimes they're really insightful. Sometimes they're bad, though. Sometimes people are asking <laughs> about penny stocks. So, it, yeah. you know, you get both sides of the spectrum. Or over-the-counter <laughs> stocks. <laughs> yeah. 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 All right. Well, we've talked about, you know, maybe stocks that people would be interested in, but maybe I'm assuming that after people have established their brokerage, probably their next question is the simple yet complicated, how do I invest? Well, to be honest, this question usually gets asked before they've established their brokerage. So oh, okay. uh, we get quite a few people who download the app 
um, and think, okay, I can invest through the app. And unfortunately, you can't do that with the My Wall Street app. Um, but my my first my first protocol is to tell them to set up a brokerage because, like, first and foremost, that is your essential tool that you need to start investing. Then, once you have a brokerage account, you need to fund your account. So it's kind of like a bank account. Really, you have to put a deposit into your bank into your brokerage account, and then with that money, you can buy the, buy any stocks on the stock market that you are investing in. Um, but setting all this usually takes time. So whilst you're waiting for your account to be approved or for your funds to be deposited, you can do some research. So the My Wall Street app is great for this because you've got a ready-made list of recommended stocks. The research is already read out, laid out for you to read. Um, and we also have the Learn section in that, which I know I've mentioned before, but it's actually a really fantastic resource. Um, and many of our members cite this as a major help when they first began investing. Um it shouldn't actually take more than a few hours, maybe even less, to read through and learn the basics. Um, then whilst you're doing all this, you should really think about a company that you use on a daily basis and see yourself using in the distant future. Um, this would probably be what we would recommend as your first company that you invest in. Um, everything else from there is much less scary once you make that first investment. It's just really about dipping your toe in the water and getting started. So. That's yeah fine. i i don't think people know that like investing is as easy as just you know like typing a few things into your phone like once you're set up with your brokerage account it is like super easy like it's it's no longer um like i know back in the day it used to be calling a broker didn't it? and then like yeah. you, you know, you'd say how many shares you wanted and things like that and but now yeah. it's like literally it's like i find it like as easy as you know ordering a takeaway like you literally put in what you want boom, boom, <laughs> yeah. but as long as you have money in your account you've mm -hmm. invested in a share yeah, I remember Boom, Emmett. I remember Emmett saying like he and his dad like when they started investing in the early '90s, he used to call up like an American broker, mm -hmm. and they'd only be putting in like less than fifty euro because they were just trying it out. Like they never invested anything before, and they would lose like ten or fifteen of it to brokerage fees. Yeah, from mm -hmm. the investment. Yeah, so even like having brokerage free accounts has changed everything. I uh, I had an interview with a customer the other week there, and. Um, and during our chat, he was like, oh, "You guys have it so easy these days." Um, I think he, I think he's in his fifties or sixties, and he was saying that when he first started investing, the brokerage fees were astronomical, mm. and it was only if you had money you could yeah. invest. Um, whereas these days, I think we're so lucky; we it's so much more accessible. There's mm. so much more information online, and you can you can invest as little as like ten dollars if you have a fractional brokerage, so a fractional yeah. share brokerage. Really yeah cool. we're really spoiled nowadays yeah <laughs> um so i know we've kind of talked with this before but when you get asked can you recommend a brokerage for your con for their specific country what do you say yeah i direct people to the brokerage help article that i wrote um mm -hmm. it's on a help center as mentioned um mm -hmm. but yeah you really just need to find a brokerage that suits your needs um and the recommendation should be based on your location and your nationality. Um, and essentially, it's just feeling out what's best for you because some brokers have higher commission fees, but then you've got more options, so like more stocks on the US stock market that has access to. Maybe it has access to ETFs, maybe it doesn't. So it's really about how you want to invest. It's such a personal choice. You have to do the research for it. So, yeah. Mm. Talking about stock access, actually, what do you say when someone comes to you and says, oh, I can't find this stock? Um, or do you, like, do you know where I can find it? What's the best answer for that? Um, so it depends. So if you can't find a particular stock on our app, then it might not be in the short in our shortlist. Um, so it could still be a listed stock. It could be on um, it could be on the US stock market. Or quite often we get people asking, oh, I can't find this stock. And it's on a uh, the Swedish stock market it's like mm -hmm. a Swedish exchange um or the London exchange so these aren't really stocks that I can help with um but yeah there's there's other things as well people ask where's the stock and they, they've gotten confused between a public and a private listing a public and a private mm -hmm. company and this was actually a mistake that I made when I first started writing for my Wall Street um I was asked to write a small bio with my favorite stock and I wanted to choose something cool and edgy and a bit eco-conscious so I, I chose Patagonia um, and I was very quickly told that this is not a public stock um, and it's a private company so that was kind of my first real lesson it's what the difference between a public and private company is um, 
and then I ended up choosing Amazon, which I kind of regret today because I don't <laughs> really agree with the company ethos, even if I still do use them for a quick thing like a costume for a party that I've got about, which <laughs> I did this week. So, <laughs> <laughs> from what extreme do they like going from Patagonia to Amazon? <laughs> I know. <laughs> I'm a sucker for uh, for quick delivery times. Oh yeah, <laughs> fair, fair. So as we all are. Yeah. So then. What do you tell users if they ask when should you sell their socks? Which is a very kind of complicated question. Yeah, this this um this question frustrates me on behalf of like the person who's writing in. Um, I kind of feel for them because here at my Wall Street, we pretty much say that you shouldn't sell. Um, particularly if there's volatility in the market. Like we bought, we follow a buy and hold philosophy. So telling this to anyone and ask this question, I always feel quite bad. Um, I think they kind of want a clear cut definition of when to sell and Mm. buy but really this is something that again is a personal decision like we advocate holding for the long term but maybe you need to sell later in life to fund buying a house or for your retirement Mm. so in these cases selling is a decision you should make on your own or with your financial advisor but yeah 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 Yeah. but sometimes things come up in life and I will actually admit I remember I think in last year I had to pay for I think a holiday which I shouldn't say but I ended up selling some Tesla shares and I've I could never regret it I more. could not breaking the cardinal rule. Oh, <laughs> I think it's good to be honest on the podcast that even like I were I know I shouldn't sell but I honestly yeah. like I needed the money like yeah and, Nicole, Nicole it's a good lesson on a call one time she's like oh yeah like I I had to I had to sh- sell some shares and I was like sorry I was like I didn't know that was an option I was like I thought we were holding these till death like but well, like <laughs> I actually did need the money like really bad but I will tell people that was like yeah obviously a budget mistake on my end but you know it does happen and Mm -hmm. I remember like I think like it was so annoying like Tesla went up like literally Mm. in like two days like a lot after Mm. I'd sold so take it from me guys like budget better and I think Mm. as well I was paying I I wanted to go on a holiday or something like that so maybe (laughs) I should have prioritized but things do happen in life so yeah like sometimes you do need to sell but then the benefit of holding it is just like amazing so mm. that's why we even tell people to um to have a an emergency fund of like yeah. six months expenses and then that will really like prevent you from having to sell a stock um yeah too early but yeah but yes. also one thing one thing to remember is like you're not taking this money to the grave with you so if you do yeah. have to sell to fund an extravagant mm. holiday in your 20s then like mm. you can start again if you need to as well mm. so. yeah mm. Nic- nicole the emergency fund in tesla stock yeah. apparently <laughs> i did yeah and that's another lesson i've learned yeah yeah like <laughs> i was probably too reliant on um just putting out any bit of spare cash into the stock market yeah. thinking that that's better but then it actually is counterproductive mm-hmm. but yeah the okay story. here speaking of speaking of tesla tesla which is uh it's actually down now so maybe you actually may maybe the short term be pulled off an actual short-term win um and i think i can speak for all of us at the minute our, our i think our uh our faith in the market might be a bit shaken i know we we've been hearing that from users so when people write in and tell you my portfolio is in the red and i don't know what to do what do, what do you say is there is there any nugget of advice that you give I mean, as you've said, this is super topical. So like, I think I touched on it previously, but the market is terrible at the moment. Mm -hmm. Everything's in the red, like it's causing a lot of stress. Um, But this is just one of the many examples across the stock, across stock market history, where a decrease in value is seen for most growth stocks across the board. Um, My portfolio is in the red. I'm sure Nicole and Anna-Marie's portfolio is in the red. Like everyone's portfolio is just down at the moment. So my advice is you are not alone. Um, If you were really, really brave, (laughs) you could snatch up a few shares at discounted prices with the kind of the risk of them immediately sinking lower to a lower price tomorrow. But, you know, like they they will go back up again. Um, Mm -hmm. One of the things to remember is that the stock market always recovers it recovered after the worst recession ever in 1948 and the 10 other so recessions that we've had since then. Um, but they're manageable in the long term by holding through the turmoil, holding through the turmoil and coming out the other side is that's whether that's in two years or in two months, the market will grow again. So I think it's just a case of holding, <laughs> just hold yeah. it, hold on. 
Definitely. Yeah. And this is actually really fresh in my mind because I've just did a TikTok about some like advice that Peter Lynch gave. And like in a 90s uh, newsroom conference, he said that if you're a long term investor, you only need to know this about the market fluctuating. Like every two years, the market goes down 10 percent. And every six years, it goes it goes down 25 percent, but it always rebounds and goes up. He goes, it's literally just like a pattern. So when you're a long term investor, volatility is actually your friend because then the shares are cheaper when they go down. And if you use like, you know, dollar cost averaging, just dollar cost average your way through it. I just thought that was great. Like it was so like mm. it actually is so like a pattern, like every two years it goes down 10. Then it, then it goes every six years, it goes down 25 percent. And that's a bear market. But it's just very interesting. And but again, when people see red, they get see panic stations. And I, yeah. I felt like that as well. But the best thing to do is just to if you're investing 200 euros a month when the market was going well, you should be doing the same when the market's doing bad. And I think that's the easiest thing to remember. Yeah, mm-hmm. definitely. Yeah. I was also actually at a lunch today um, with some other women in finance and, and uh, one of them said, something was quite good that was oh, volatility is the price that you pay for the power of compounding that it just kind of comes along mm. with in, mm. in investing and that is you know the you kind of have to grow your courage a bit in those early years of investing and then i'm sure after five seven ten years you kind of settle into it and you understand all right this is cyclical and this will come back mm. yeah so like good. volatility is like the little annoying brother of compound <laughs> yeah <laughs> something you have yeah. to put up with but yeah definitely <laughs> that's gas i love that actually um okay so on to the next one um what do you think is the value that my wall street brings our users and investors um so my i think the value that my wall street gives investors is that we give back time and energy mm-hmm. um our analysts are highly experienced yes i'm marie <laughs> mm-hmm. are highly highly experienced and they're fantastic researchers like Anytime I read any of Anne-Marie's or Mike's or Rory's articles, they're just so well researched and you really fully believe in them. Um, So essentially, we just do all the legwork for our members, presenting each stock picked with a full thesis, fully laid out piece of research. And this saves our members time. And when it comes to researching stocks that they want to invest in, it saves them energy as well. Like if you don't know what stocks to invest in, you're going to save so much energy just by having a list there with all the mm-hmm. research. Um, but then the other value, I think, is that the daily content that is produced by both our analyst team and our team of writers um, is that like the daily market news cuts through all that noise that you find online on Twitter, Reddit or any of the other any other news site. So. Yeah, really, my Wall Street's value is in the time and energy saved for a busy professional who wants to invest. Plus, you get the daily market news that cuts through all the noise. Yeah. And I think another great thing about my Wall Street does is that our analysts are always updating and looking back. So like, you know, if they did pick a stock a few years ago and the investment thesis has changed, they Mm -hmm. will let you know about that. And they're very honest about like, this might, this has changed right now. But they also say like, but Maybe, maybe it's because of the market or maybe it's because of wider economic issues. And that's also a re- like really valuable because, you know, it would take you a lot of time to pick a short list of stocks. But then you also think, how long is it going to take me to update them every year as well and make sure that everything is still in line and on track and the company's still doing well? And like earnings reports, like our analysts analyze them for you as well and factor them in when they're updating. So like that just takes like so much time. And as you said, yeah, it's all time and energy saved. Yeah. You're welcome. (laughs) (laughs) Hey, you're welcome. Okay, so now it's time for one of our regular segments. This is the Girl Boss of the Week. Girl Boss of the Week. So Anne Marie, who is it this time? Well, after we had this, you know, very reasonable and rational rational discussion about, you know, regular investing, investing in companies that you know, big traditional assets, I thought it would be good to go in the complete opposite direction. And pick a girl boss of the week from the crypto space, which has really been going through it this week. It's been quite bad. So our girl mm. boss of the week this week is the Celsius Network, which is a cryptocurrency exchange and loan company. Uh-oh. 
Um, its unique selling point was it allowed users to take out loans against their crypto holdings by placing them into secure accounts. Um, you could also place your funds into a Celsius wallet and earn a percentage yield, which is kind of like a crypto savings account. And apparently on things like Bitcoin, which is quite considered a quite a stable cryptocurrency, you could get up to a six to seven percent annualized return. So people were really excited about this. You know, this was kind of a legitimizing of using cryptocurrencies. You know, this looked a little bit more like a traditional bank. However, all of this was very much hinged upon the ideas that cryptocurrency was going to be consistently going up and everyone was going to be getting into cryptocurrency and no one was ever going to take any of their funds out. But it would appear that they're experiencing what I guess we could call a bank run, which is people are pretty panicked at the minute. As we know, um, cryptocurrency is falling. People are worried we're going into a mild recession. They're getting more conservative with their money. Um, and that has meant that Celsius is having a bit of a hard time and they in the last couple of days halted withdrawals which is interesting because it kind of goes against their long-standing motto of cryptocurrency mm -hmm. available anytime anywhere and uh, actually funnily enough their chief executive alex matt mashinsky challenged a critic on june 11th on twitter and he said he said quote find even one person who has a problem with drawing and uh, two days ago, they announced that you're no longer allowed to withdraw any cryptocurrency from any of your accounts. <laughs> so it would appear that there actually were quite a few people who who were uh, struggling. And uh, now Celsius is struggling and is on uh, would appear it will be heading towards insolvency within the next 24 to 48 hours, unfortunately. And I, I know what you're all thinking. Like we as in my Wall Street, we don't follow cryptocurrency. So how does this impact us? What does this matter to us? Well, unfortunately, because of the hype cycle that appeared around mm -hmm. cryptocurrency in 2020 and 2021 they it actually is in some ways embedded into our market you know there's a number of companies that ipo think of things like robin hood or coinbase well it turns out that the second largest pension fund in canada reportedly invested more than 400 million dollars into celsius last year so mm -hmm. i would God. assume that they're going to lose that entire investment <laughs> um and shockingly enough they actually made that investment after united states regulators began to raise concerns about celsius's business practices they, they made the investment anyway last year so not great all around so our girl boss of the week this week is celsius networks and maybe the runner-up for girl boss of the week is the second largest pension fund in canada that doesn't seem to have been doing its due diligence yeah not great for their users unlike this whole episode which was good for my wall street users Incredi <laughs> incredibly informative and uh, uh and well researched and considerate and um not based on a Somewhat Wim. fictional concept of technology. <laughs> <laughs> Amazing. Thanks for that, yep. Amory. No problem. So that's a wrap. And thank you so much, Poppy, for coming on to FML Fund My Life. We'll definitely have you back again. Yes. Well, thank you for having me. It's been a pleasure. It's sure, been so we nice. Have, we can have a second episode called Not So Frequently Asked Questions. Uh, yeah. and me and Nicole <laughs> will just make up the worst questions we can think of and we'll just ask you live <laughs> on air. I think that yeah. would be fair. Yeah. Oh, yeah. God. We'll do, a, we'll do a live stream of that. <laughs> yeah. That could be our second Christmas episode. We'll go and we'll record it in the pub because I have already requested that our Christmas episode be me and Nicole discussing National Treasure, which Nicole has <laughs> never seen. I still haven't seen it. Oh, I've seen it. It's it's a, it's a not a good movie, but it's a great well, movie. No, it's not. But I, like... I was forced to watch it because uh, <laughs> my my partner found out that I, I had never seen, seen it. it. And mm. he was like, we're watching this it's, now. It's important. <laughs> it's, it's very important. Yeah. Yeah. It was so silly. It was the silliest. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Sorry, Nicole. I've, I ruined the wrap up. You go ahead. Well, it's actually you next. <laughs> oh, sorry. Uh, if you enjoyed this episode, <laughs> tune back in in two weeks time. <sighs> And if you want to follow us on socials, please do. It would make my life a lot easier. You can find us on Instagram at Fun My Life Podcast, on Twitter at My Wall Street HQ, and on TikTok at My Wall Street, or on our brand new account dedicated to this podcast, which you can find at Anne Marie and Nicole FML. And finally, if you're ready to start your investing journey and are looking for resources, check out My Wall Street's Getting Started podcast anywhere you listen to podcasts or download the My Wall Street Learn app. Both will be linked below. If you want to access our list of stocks handpicked by our analysts, including me and lots of other interesting finance and business content, download the My Wall Street app and create your free account today. So that's all from me, Anne-Marie and Poppy. We hope you enjoyed listening.